Now, it might not feel like it right now, but summer is actually winding down. Yeah, you know, really, but it had, you know, it's been what? What's the high been? Like in the mid-90s all week, it's been so, so hot. It looks like we're going to get a break by Wednesday, but summer's winding down, you know? Most of us, were in this kind of back-to-school season, um, and that kind of gives you, you know, just a little bit of a different perspective on things, and, uh, you know, you see all the pictures on Facebook, and everybody's got their hair parted, and, you know, the kids have got the little suits on and everything, the girls' dresses, but, you know, I feel like that this is probably a little bit more accurate for some of us, you know, dad's pushing it, you know, it's time to go, mom is all dancing and everything, she's just like, you know, it is time for y'all to get out of the house, I've had enough of you guys, Right? But, you know, back to school, it also brings up some memories. And I don't know about you, but when I was little, um, and even when my kids were little, uh, the back to school shopping was just such a, was just such a great memory and such a, you know, you get out there and you see, you get new pencils and all that stuff. And I remember growing up when I was in elementary school, one of the biggest things, one of the best things to pick out was your lunchbox. Anybody with me on that, right? You just, you went to the store and back then, you know, they had all the, the metal kind of, you know, give you poisoning kind of lunch boxes all up on the shelf. And it was just so great to pick out your lunch box. I remember my, one of my favorite was, was my Dukes of Hazard lunch box. <laughs> I loved Dukes of Hazard when I was little. It was one of my favorite shows. And uh, I remember, we actually still have this lunch box at my mom and dad's house. My dad's got a building out back, and uh, he's got a lot of, like, antique stuff around, and it's sitting on top of the shelf. So I actually still have that somewhere. And the other thing, the other thing, especially if you grew up, if you're my age, was this. Who, what is this? The Trapper Keeper, right? You were like, Mom, Dad, if y'all buy me this, I will get straight A's all year. Everything's going to be organized, and you carry it in, and you hear that Velcro rip. It's like, you know, man, I'm really living in, you know, the future now, right? You got the trapper keeper, you know? And and then, but the thing is about back to school, it's almost this new, you know, summer's winding down, and fall's coming, and it's almost, you get this feeling of almost like a new season. It's almost like a mini New Year's kind of thing. And maybe even if your kids are out of the house, you're probably still ingrained with this because you've had to deal with this for decades, you know. So you still got, and so your kids are out of the house and you start thinking, you know what, I'm going to get back in shape. I'm going to wake up early every morning. I'm going to make the kids breakfast. They're going to have eggs and sausages and pancakes every morning, right? And you're, well, maybe not, but maybe you're at least thinking that for maybe five minutes, you know, and then you're like, nah, never mind. But I was going to make dinner every night. You know, and even churches now, you'll see a lot of churches will have these back to church campaigns because they know, churches know that you're winding down and you're getting back to a normal routine. You know, you're not just like, oh, I'm going to go to the lake this weekend, you know, at the spur of the moment. So they know. And even the, the Jewish holiday is coming up. What is the name of that? What'd you say? Yeah, thank you for not making me try to pronounce that. <laughs> Because I can't even say English words right most of the time. But it's like a starting, it's, that is September 6th. So it's a, ste- a season of starting over. So this morning what I want to talk about is maybe some resolutions. And usually what happens with resolutions is what happens to resolutions. They're gone, right? You've got maybe two weeks if you're really good. You know, so we're going to call these commitments. Which I believe, if we do these commitments, I believe they're going to radically make a difference in our lives especially if we follow through with them. So what I want to do is offer you a way of starting this back to school or this fall season that could significantly change your life. So here's what I suggest. If you make these four commitments, if you make four commitments that God in his word encourages you to make, I believe this season of your life could be one of the most significant events of your life. If you will follow God's advice, it could become a gateway to having a more fulfilling life in him. So I challenge you to make these four commitments for fall. Now, this first commitment is probably not going to be any surprise. You're going to be like, oh, yeah, I've heard that a few times. I even kind of touched on it a few weeks ago when I spoke, and we were talking about how, you know, God wants to do maybe a new ministry in your life or have you something new. But the thing about it is we are what? We are stubborn, right? We are stubborn people. 
we get into a bad habit, and it's when we're stubborn, we get these bad habits, we just have to have things just pounded in our heads. Like when if, you have your, if you're a parent and you've got a two-year-old, you have to repeat yourself over and over and over and over. No, 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 right? So we need to hear these things. So the first thing is this, is to commit yourself to forget your failures. Forget, uh, commit yourself to forget your failures. Now we can probably all agree that failures is just part of living life, right? You can probably think of one thing that you did this week just like that, right? Real easy. But even your biggest mistake, even your biggest mistake more than likely didn't cost as much money as this. Who knows what this is? Anybody. Probably, what was that? The Zune, right? You're probably like, what is that? It was an MP3 player. It was supposed to rival Apple, the Apple iPod, right? And it's just like, and, you know, they had really bad marketing. What happens? Well, and in an article in uh, January 2007, it claims that Microsoft lost $289 million in one quarter. In one quarter, they lost that much money. And even if you managed to grab one of these, and I heard they were great, up until December 31st of 2008, when most, if not all, the 30, uh, 30 gigabyte Zooms, they stopped working simply because of an underlying code that had failed to account for the extra day in leap year. So when they were designing this thing, they didn't even think about, oh, yeah, there's another day in leap year. And then they stopped working. Another product failure, who remembers these beauties? Anybody ever eat these? Oh, yeah, you must have eaten some. And they do not have very good rye. <laughs> Probably has some very bad memories about this. This is the Wow Chips. They were, supposed, they were a fat-free chip. But the problem was is they, came, they contained a stuff called Olestra. And Olestra is an artificial fat that was supposed to pass harmlessly through the digestive tract. However, it caused gastrointestinal side effects that we will not talk about here. If you feel, you know, you can go look that up and you'll be like, oh, yeah, okay, no wonder, right? It was pretty bad. It even resulted in lawsuits for this thing. So we might not make multi-million dollar mistakes. But the problem is, is that our failures, they can haunt us for decades, for years. They cost us more than money. They cost us our freedom. They cost us our freedom to move on. Even in the secular mental health circles, there are articles about the dangers of not letting go of the past. So let's check out this quote. This is from Psychology Today. He says, according to neuroscience, the brain handles negative and positive information differently. Negative experiences require more thinking and thus are processed more thoroughly. This causes our brains to become better at remembering adverse events. Reliving sad memories make us feel like a hamster in a wheel. No matter how hard we try, we just can't move forward. Now, maybe this doesn't apply to some of you today. Maybe you, some of you have already gotten past this in your lives, and you're like, you know, I'm actually pretty good. But maybe you probably know somebody, and maybe you, this will help you help somebody else that you know that might be going through this. But if we're in this trap or you know somebody in this trap, what do we do? So let's go to the Word of God. Let's see what that says. So we're going to go to Philippians. We're going to Philippians chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 13. And 2,000 years ago, one of the first Christian leaders, Paul, gave this advice. He said, Brothers and sisters, I do not regard myself as having taken hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward for what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. See, Paul was not satisfied. He just wanted to keep growing. He had this holy discontentment about where his life was, and he just wanted to just keep pressing on. Now, some, most of our failures are probably not going to be, end up listed on a website somewhere, but the problem is, is what? They're recorded in our, in our minds. They're recorded in our hearts. They're painful memories for some of us, memories of maybe how you failed a relationship. You know, you made the wrong decision. You said the wrong thing, and that relationship ended. Maybe you feel like you failed your parents. 
Parents, maybe you feel like that you have failed your children. You probably have felt like that you have failed yourself in some way. But God is here. God is here right now. And he wants you to know you do not have to live your life imprisoned by your past. What God's word is saying is that we must not allow ourselves to be bogged down by our past failures. We must not dwell on our past so that we can move forward into the future that God has for us. And what better time than now for you to rise to that challenge and to say to yourself, you know what, with God's help, I am going to forget that past. I am going to stop torturing myself about what I did or did not do. And today is the day to stop being chained by your failures. God is saying here in his word that he doesn't want you to go through your life branding yourself as a failure. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, forgiveness Forgiveness becomes a reality in our lives. We have received Christ's forgiveness. It allows us to forgive ourselves. And sometimes that's the hardest person to forgive, isn't it? It's to forgive yourself. But it allows us to forgive ourselves and forget our failures. And so not only do we need to forgive ourselves, we also need to do what? We need to forgive others. And that leads us to our second commitment Commit yourself to give up your grudges. Commit yourself to give up your grudges. We're just going to go to the book of Colossians, chapter 3, verse 13. Colossians, chapter 3, verse 13. He says this, Bear with each other and forgive each other. Whatever, whatever grievances you may have against whatever. Uh, one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. God, in those words, is challenging you to directly and personally give up your grudges. And that's what he means when he says to forgive each other whatever grievances you may have. You need to let go of that grudge, that deep, ongoing resentment that we cultivate in our hearts against someone else, that unforgiving spirit that leads to unforgiving attitudes and unforgiving actions. Listen, it's like we're harboring a grudge. Harboring a grudge is about nursing, like nursing a dislike for someone. Think about that. You're nursing. You continue, continue to feed it. You make it well. You hold on to it close to your chest, right here, right where your heart is. But what you need to know that grudges are destructive. They destroy marriages. They break up families. They're going to ruin friendships. Grudges even split churches. Because let's be honest, that one of the scandals in the church is the grudges that Christians hold against each other. So today, if you know that you are holding a grudge against someone, then God has something to say to you. He's saying, look, just give it up. Because grudges are not just destructive, they are also self-destructive. Let me ask you something. Do you think that the people that you are holding a grudge against, do you think they even know? No? Maybe. Do you think if they do, do you think they really care? Probably not. You know, a couple of years ago, what happened is I got this message on Facebook. It was somebody I have not spoken to in almost 20 years. And they were like, hey, you know, you're looking good, you're a good-looking family and everything. And I just want you to know, this is true. She said, I just want you to know that I have forgiven you for how you hurt me 20 years ago. I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, I mean, it was such a shock. And I, you know, honestly, to be completely honest, I was probably pretty flippant about it. I was probably like, ah, oh, whatever, okay. You know, but I didn't know, right? I never knew. My point is, is that when you hold a grudge against someone, you will hurt yourself more than you ever, ever will hurt the person you're holding against. Christian author Max Lucado, he makes this interesting comment about holding a grudge. He says this, Unforgiving servants always end up in prison. Prisons of what? Of anger and guilt and depression. So please, please do not sentence yourself to this emotional prison. Get set free. Get set free today. Give up your grudges. Forgive each other whatever, whatever grievances you may have against one another. 
According to God's word, the way to give up a grudge is to forgive a grievance. Now, please hear me say this. Please hear me say this. God is not asking you. He's not asking you to ignore whatever that person has done to you. He's not asking you to pretend that it didn't happen. He doesn't ask you to condone it. He doesn't ask you to pretend that it doesn't matter. What God asks you to do is to forgive the grievance. That means acknowledge how wrong and painful it was, but to decide to forgive the person who did the wrong. Some of you today, you need to forgive the grievance, maybe against your parents, maybe against your children, whether they're young or old, maybe against your spouse, maybe some harsh words come up, maybe someone at work, you know, that person that you're just like, oh, man, I just wish they would get sick so they wouldn't be here. You know, that person, maybe someone in this congregation, maybe someone that used to be in this congregation and is not here anymore because of a mask or what they said on Facebook. God says that deep-seated resentment you have against that person that has to go. And by giving up your grievance, it can sometimes be the first step in our next commitment, which is this. Commit yourself to restore your relationships. Commit yourself to restore your relationships. So we're going to look at chapter 12 of Romans. Chapter 12 of Romans in verse 18. Here the author Paul, he shares about how we are to love in the family of God. We are the love in the family of God and what our faith should look like with one another. So, verse 18, chapter 12, Paul gives us some challenging advice of how we are to deal with others. Okay, he says, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Now, Pastor Tony Evans explains this verse this way. He says, many interpret this verse to say, in essence, be patient for as long as you can. But once your patience runs out, get ready to throw down. But this verse is actually saying, as far as it depends on you, that is, on your side of the relationship, you live at peace with everyone. Do everything you can to get along with people. And if they should still harbor a grudge, then that's on them. So the important phrase here, here is, as far as it depends on you. By using this phrase, God is personally challenging each one of us to do all we can to restore our relationships. We do everything you can to restore any relationship that has gone wrong in your life. Now, some relationships might have gone wrong in your life not because they may have gone wrong in your life because of what other people have done to you. And they may not want that relationship restored. And God recognizes that. That's why he's saying, if it is possible. But let's be honest. Right? Let's be honest here. Some of our relationships have gone wrong because of something that we have done, right? So when God's word says here, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone, it is saying if you have caused, if you have caused this rift in a relationship, then you have a responsibility to do everything you can to restore it. And that probably will include one of the most difficult things you can ever do, and is this asking for forgiveness. And who are the people that is most difficult to ask forgiveness from? It is the people that we are closest to, family members, people you live with in your house every day, right? Apologizing to your kids. What? I used to, live, I used to uh, work under a pastor um, in Florida, Rick Evans, and he used to talk about this a lot. He, um, he had to overcome uh, a pretty bad temper. He grew up with a an abusive dad, and so he had to kind of overcome this bad temper that he had. And he would talk about, he had four kids, he would talk about how that he would uh, apologize to his kids. He would, now, it was so foreign to me at the time. I was like, you, you, you can't show weakness in front of your kids. Like, I'm the dad, I'm right, you know, you know. You can't do that. And it was, it was just so foreign. But as my kids, as they grew older, and I realized that I was not a perfect parent, Right? I got hangry. I'm a, I am super introverted. You think you're, I, you know, so I'm just like, just leave me alone. I just want to sit here and just listen to myself breathe. You know? <laughs> just, just please don't. 
You know, and I'm not, and I know my kids are probably, they're listening, they're like, yeah, he's definitely not. I, I do, I get upset. I'm a flawed human being. I have a bad day. I get frustrated with having to tell them the same thing over and over again. I get frustrated with them telling me the same thing over and over again, right? So there have been times, though, that, I have, that I've had to go to my kids and say, <laughs> I've had to go to my kids and just be like, you know what? I'm sorry. Now, I may have meant what I said, but I'm really sorry for how I said it. I was in a bad mood. This happened, I, transparent, this happened just, what, Friday night. I don't know what it was. Something was just landing on me, and I was just, I was upset. And I said things in a way that I shouldn't have. And I was like, man, I'm so sorry. You know, I'm so sorry I said it that way. You know, and it's not easy. I can tell you, it is extremely humbling to go to your kids and say, I am so sorry for how I spoke to you. But I also believe that our relationships are stronger because of it. And I, what I'm doing, I'm setting an example for them also that, you know what, if I say something and it's, it's hurtful or I say things in a harmful way, that we should apologize. We should be gentle at heart. And if you have older kids, let me tell you, it's, just, it's not too late to start. Call them up, apologize. And young people, you are not off the hook. You are not off the hook. I'm sure that out of your frustration, they said, hey, it's dinner time. You're like, I oh, know it's dinner time, right? And you've been yell you yelled at them from, you know. Let me tell you something as a parent. You might think that you cannot hurt your parents' feelings, but you can. You can hurt their feelings, okay? Do this. Try this. Go tell your mom and dad. Go walk up to them and just be like, you know what? I was upset the other day, and I, I snapped at you, and I'm so sorry. And then help them pick their jaw up off the floor, <laughs> put their eyeballs back in their sockets, right? But I can guarantee if you start doing this, your relationships are going to get so much stronger. Okay, married couples too. How many married marriages represented here are not all that they should be because someone won't say that I was wrong, okay, that I am sorry. Will you forgive me? There have been many times in my marriage that I did not think that I should be the one apologizing first, or at all. I can't, what are you talking about? I didn't do anything wrong. But you know, I am, I'm not a very confrontational person. I hate conflict. So after about five minutes of conflict, I just, I just want to get this resolved. I don't care. I will go apologize. Honey, I'm sorry for what I said, how I said it, all those things. And, and honestly, there's been times where I haven't meant it. I'm just like, I'm just, I, just wanna, I just want this to be over, you know? And then it opens up a conversation, and guess what I realized? I was not as innocent as I thought I was, right? I was like, oh, I did say that that way. Or an or old hurt comes, you know, you're, you're like this a lot. I am? Yeah, I mean, think about it. we all got these blind spots, right? Things that we don't realize that how we act sometimes, and it takes somebody that we love that will come up and say, you know, you're kind of this way, and you're like, really? It's like, yeah, you are. So you got to be careful, because the people you love, they're going to see your blind spots, right? They're going to see these things, you know? And if you do see somebody, if you see their blind spot, do it in a loving way, you know? Don't, I can't, you know, just tell them. Say, hey, you know, I see this about you. Can we just talk about this? All right. So maybe God is saying that to you this morning. This is, this is a time to restore the relationships you've ruined. It's going to be difficult, okay? But we have to admit our past errors, errors in relationships and humbly seek forgiveness from the one that we have hurt. Maybe it is your heavenly father. Maybe it is God that you need to ask forgiveness from, which leads us to our fourth final commitment, which is this. Commit yourself to turn your back on your sins. We're going to look again in the book of Romans. We are going, we are going to be in chapter 6 this time. Here we see that Paul is anticipating a problem. In the church. But problems in the church? Yes, problems in the church. It always been, even back then, there were problems in the church, okay? It's just, just part of us. We're flawed human beings right here in the church. There's going to be problems in the church. So he's anticipating the problem that there's going to be Christians who often make the mistake of seeing grace as a license to do whatever they want to. 
And if more sins mean more grace, then why not just sin on purpose? You know, just why not just live it up? So here in the book of Romans, we see God's answer to this. He says this, well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? And I can see him going, of course not. Are you crazy? You know, of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when you were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we, were jo we, we joined him in his death? For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism. And just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. New lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that, so that, sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free. Set free. Do you live like you were set free from the power of sin? We were set free from the power of sin. Skipping to verse 12, do not, so do not let your sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. That is our last challenge, and I believe that we will rise to meet this challenge. It will make this season of our lives significantly different. Something to look back on and say, that was my turning point right there. When God says, do not let sin control the way you live, do not give in to sinful desires, he is issuing the challenge to what? To turn your back on your sins. Now, some of us are probably still living with habitual sins, sin habits right now. Most of us, when we are saved, there's probably a lot of, you know, some sins that were easy for us to give up, you know, but a lot, for a lot of us, we got that one sin that's kind of hard to battle with. And what happens is, sadly, sometimes we just give up on that one sin and we end up living these double lives. Look at this pornography epidemic that has just gone into the church. Now, these are just, these are Christian men. So the, the numbers will be a little lower than maybe we see, but this is Christian men between 18 and 30. 32% 30 admit being addicted to pornography, and another 12% think they may be. Let me tell you something. If you're in that 12% and you're like, I might be addicted to pornography, I don't know. Yes, just go ahead and put yourself in that other percent. If you think that you are, more than likely you are. And for Christians ages 31 to 49... 18% admit, and the other percent tell themselves that they are not addicted to pornography. And then there are the other habitual sins that we can get trapped by. We might have a quick temper. It's, you know, having a quick temper, it can be habitual, right? Because it just like kind of lets it out, and you don't care who you are slashing down, right? Maybe, maybe is it a gossiping tongue that loves to assassinate other people's characters? Maybe it's a sharp tongue that easily wounds other people's feelings. Or maybe you have a critical judgment attitude. As soon as you see somebody, you're judging them right away. Or as soon as you hear them speak, you're like, I could do that better. You know, whatever it might be. But too many Christians have this attitude to their habitual sins where they won't do anything about it right? And they just learn to live with it. But I have to ask you this, is your spiritual life crippled because you have learned to live with that habitual sin? I can tell you when I was living in my habitual sin, it absolutely was crippled. Even though I knew of God's forgiveness in my life, I was still, I remember going places and being around other Christians and just be kind of like, you know, I know what I did last night because I'm not going to forget. They might not know, but I know. And then it's like, well, how many times can I go back to God and forgive myself, you know, before he just completely gives up on me? God has not given up on you. Thank God he has not given up on me and that he did not give up on me. So God challenges you to turn back on that sin, whatever it is. Stop letting control the way you live. Stop giving into it. He wants you to stop obeying your old master. Listen to this. Jesus' death broke the power of sin, and the Holy Spirit 
will give you the power to resist this sin. That means that you don't have to go into this new season still being defeated by your old sin. You can be set free. You can have victory over it. Look at what Paul writes just a few verses down in Romans chapter 6 and verse 20. Listen to this. He says, when you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. But what was the result? You are now ashamed of the things you used to do, things that end in eternal doom. But now you are free. You are free from the power of sin and have become slaves of God. Now you do those things that lead to holiness and result in what? Eternal life. Life. For the wages of sin is death. But this is the best part. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. God says you are no longer a slave to sin. If you will ask God's forgiveness to your sin and his power to resist that sin, then this can be the new era of your spiritual life. So don't miss this opportunity. Are you willing to take these challenges from God, these commitments, to forget your failures, to give up your grudges, to restore your relationships, and to turn your back on your sins. Now listen, don't do it alone. You were never meant to do it alone. Your most important relationship is a relationship that you have with your heavenly Father. So how are you doing with that? Are you just giving them five minutes every other day? Maybe just a little bit, turn on the radio on your way to work and listen to Way FM, or does Way FM here? The Christian radio station on your way to work. You know, or are you treating him like a heavenly father where you sit next to him and not only do you talk, but you also listen to what he has to say? Pray, pray. And it doesn't have to be the formal prayer. Pray. He's a heavenly. Yes. Is he the awesome God, the king of the universe? Yes. And. He is your heavenly Father that cares so much for you and loves you so much. He loves you. You know what? Not only that, He likes you. He likes you. And He, if you have been away from Him, He misses you. Okay? He misses you. So run to Him. Call out to Him. Cry out to Him. God, I am so sorry for what I've done. But you are my Father. So restore that relationship with your heavenly Father. Read, study, and meditate on his word because that's how we know who he is. That's the gift that he has given us is his word. So spend time with him in prayer. And if you are in a sin habit, don't give up. Don't give up. You are going to have days where you might have a couple of good days and then you're going to fall down again. But I just beg of you, don't give up. Because what if this one time, what if this one time that you decided that you give up, what if that was the time that it finally stuck? I had to tell myself that. Every time I would fall and fall and fall again, and I'm like, you know what? I, I just got nothing left. But then I got to thinking, it's like, well, what if this was it? What if this was that, if I decided to go at it one more time, ask for forgiveness, I said, God, will you please help me? What if this was the day that I stopped doing that? And I would never know because I gave up. So if you, something happens, get up, knock the dust off your pants, right? And say, you know what? I'm going to try it again. So I want you to have the courage right here today to forgive yourself. Forgive yourself. Forget the past. Forgive others. Whatever grievances you have, ask for forgiveness from the ones that you may have hurt. You may even ask, have to ask God, say, you know what? I don't know, have I hurt somebody? And ask Him to remind you so you can restore that relationship. Ask God's forgiveness and no longer be a slave to sin. Now, if you are new here, we like to give everyone an opportunity to reflect and act on what God is saying to us right now. So if we'll just all stand. And the worship team is going to lead us in a song. You can sing with us. You can pray at your seat. 
You can come up to the altar. The only thing I would ask is that you listen to what God is telling you to do right now and that you respond appropriately. Okay? So let's all worship, sing, and pray together.